was to realize that nobody controlled my happiness. Right? Nobody created opportunities for me. Nobody took away opportunities. Nobody destroyed opportunities. It was all about me. And that was a game changer. When I realized that regardless of who you are in my life, you don't create my happiness. I do. And unfortunately, it took me most of my adult teenage and adult years to really understand the magnitude of that. So I'm really enjoying my senior years. <laughs> so I'm praying that some of our young people get it here so they can enjoy all their years. Right? You know, um, one of the most astounding scriptures in the word that has always caught my attention was, Beloved, I wish above all things you may prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. It caught my attention because it was not the picture that I was seeing in the church. I wasn't seeing prosperous people, nor was I seeing anybody prospering mentally, right? I was going to church with these people five, ten years, and they were still having the same hang-ups, the same problems, the same situations, the same trials, the same everything in their life, day after day after day. And I knew that I couldn't question God because his power is real. I understood that. But I wanted to find out where the disconnect was. Right? And without me knowing it, the Holy Spirit was leading me on a journey for me to connect so I could find where the disconnect was. And I thank God that he, you know, just uh, worked with me in a way where I was compliant with it and didn't resist it. In doing so, I've had a lot of battles with Christians. Not unsaved people, with Christians. Because here I am coming along saying something that they never heard of, never thought of. It was foreign to what they were doing. And after all, who am I? Right? And thank God that he gave me the tenacity to stand my ground. Right. So I'm sharing this with you today because you're going to go through some transformations that people may not understand it. You're going to go through some transformations that people just won't like it. Right. You know, um, I've had, you know, family members tell me I liked it better before you were saved. They liked the party guy. They didn't like me better. They just liked one segment of me. Right. You don't really know who you are until your soul gets completely transformed. Amen. Amen. We're on a quest to find ourselves, right? Amen. So are you ready for the word? Amen. Let's get right into it. Amen. Amen. Soul transformation number three. Our journey in life is pretty much dictated by the desires of our soul. Right. right? I've come to a conclusion that I've never had an original thought, nor have I had an original opinion. Right? Is my soul dictating everything to me, man? Right? Um, for the most part, our soul dictates our behavior. Right? You don't just behave the way that you do because that's the way you behave. You've been dictated by an undisciplined soul to act that way. Right? Why do you think the Bible tells us to train a child in the ways he should go? Right? Because it's trying to get us to discipline their soul so that they act accordingly and act appropriately, right? We overeat, we get angry, we get hostile, we shut down, we quit with no or little control over our actions. Anybody ever said you're not going to get mad in a heated situation? What happened? You were powerless against it, right? You ever said, I'm not going to overeat, I'm tired of my clothes not fitting me? Right? What happened? Somebody brought a nice, fat, chocolate piece of cake out. And your soul said, that looks good. Right? You were powerless against it. Because our souls have been dictating our behavior. Because we have undisciplined souls. My soul dictated my behavior and I, I, you know, in, in stupid, 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 stupid ways. Sitting at a stoplight. And some guy look at me, 
in the car next to me and I didn't like the way he looked, I'd jump out of the car and beat him down. My soul dictated that. I did not understand my behavior. You've been in a position where you're starting to question your behavior? Why do I say the things that I do? Why do I act the way that I do? Why do I think the way that I do? I'm too old for this. I know better than this. It's time to develop soul transformation. So as I develop soul transformation, I'm not hitting nobody. That don't mean I don't want to. I surely got tempted to. But here's the difference. My soul don't dictate to my body what to do anymore. My brother was uh, controlled by his soul too. All of us are. But he had a compulsion. He was a thief. And he, he had a compulsion to steal. Even if he didn't have to steal. He'd go in the store with three, four hundred dollars in the pocket and steal a pack of cigarettes. I asked him, why you do that? Because I didn't steal in stores. That was taboo for me. Right? I, I wouldn't steal. For, I'd rob a store, but I wouldn't steal from a store. <laughs> yeah. Amen. I just didn't do that. So I looked down on him for that, right? I said, why do you do that? He goes, I don't know. Something just comes over me, and I do it. Does that sound familiar? Something just come over me, and I lashed out at you. Forgive me, I didn't mean to get mad. I didn't mean to yell. I didn't, and you surely didn't mean to, but you had no control. Right. And I think the problem is we don't know how to exercise self-control. Right? Your soul has cravings, demands, expectations that if not met will convey to the body through temper tantrums. If you do not meet the demands of my soul, I'm going to get mad at you. And I'm going to have a temper tantrum. Your wife ever cook dinner for you and throw the pots and pans around loudly so you can know she has a problem? No. Her soul's dictating her temper tantrum and letting you know, I have to cook for you, but I'm not going to like it. Hello? We all have temper tantrums. You may not like your temper tantrum, but you are powerless against it without the power of an almighty God guiding you, leading you, directing you. Those emotional outbursts are nothing other than an expression of an undisciplined soul. And we through, see it throughout the entire Bible. Amen. I don't like it here. I'm going to pick up my marbles. I'm going to go to another church. Temper tantrum. Because you didn't satisfy, you didn't appease, you didn't quiet my soul. I didn't get the attention I wanted, I got disrespect or whatever. That's a temper tantrum. And as I said, all throughout the Bible, you see men and women that, with undisciplined souls that were called of God that had temper tantrums. Don't think because you have an anointing, you have a calling, that, you don't, that, you're, that, that, that you're not prey or subject to an undisciplined soul or temper tantrums. I've known many preachers that have temper, temper tantrums. Turn your Bibles to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. This is, I, I think, probably one of the greatest expressions of a temper tantrum that I could find in the Bible. See, when you have a temper tantrum, you're not caring about you or anybody else. All you want to do is either you vent your anger or you shut down. And they're both temper tantrums. You ever try to talk to your mate and you know they're burning up? And you ask them, what's wrong? Nothing. But the whole atmosphere in the house is unsettled, uncomfortable. This is what happened with Jonah. All because he didn't like what God told him to do. See, our soul does not like being told what to do. Whether it's God, your husband, your wife, your children, your boss. Nobody likes the spotlight on them and nobody likes being told what to do. If we didn't have a problem with being told what, we do, what to do, all of us would be at the place that God wants us. 
but we don't want to be told what to do. Many of us are having a temper tantrum just like Jonah. The problem is we're not running away. We're sitting here holding our breath. Let's read Jonah chapter 1. Don't be quiet on me this morning because I'm telling you the truth. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee from Tar- from, to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, of the Lord, uh, of the Lord, as his prophet, and he went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish for the most remote of the Phoenician trading places then known. So he paid the appointed fare and he went down into the ship to go with them to Tarshish from being in the presence of the Lord as his servant and his master. But the Lord sent a great wind upon the sea and there was a violent tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken. And he could care less. He was sleeping. When you have a temper tantrum, you don't care about nobody or nothing but you. And so here's the picture. Jonah, I want you to go to, no, God, I don't want to go. They're my enemies and I don't want to go over there. So instead, I'm going to go on a cruise. And I'm going to put everybody else's life in jeopardy because I'm having a temper tantrum. You ever been in in an automobile with somebody that is a lunatic that has a temper tantrum and all of a sudden they're doing 120? And they look over at you and tell you, we're both going to die? That's an undisciplined soul. Jonah could not help himself. Because he was not submitted to the plan of God. He may have been submitted to God, but he wasn't submitted to the plan of God. When we have undisciplined soul problems and we have temper tantrums, it's because we're not committed to the, to the situation that we're on hand to. Whether it's a marriage, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a church, whether it's a job. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're committed to your job, you deal with all the garbage of the job. How many understand that? Especially if you're in a, in a place of responsibility, a place of authority, and you see the vision and you try to make it come to pass. It doesn't matter what comes your way, you're going to deal with it because you see what? A greater picture. When you don't see a greater picture, all that matters is your temper tantrum. All that matters is you let people know you don't like or you dislike what's going on. So you have a temper to, I'm just not going to cooperate. Or, I'm going to cooperate, but I'm not going to be happy about it. That's an undisciplined soul, and they're running rampant in churches today. Not only running rampant, they're in leadership. And the problem with undisciplined souls being in leadership, they're creating that, they're replicating that same undiscipline. Come on, somebody say amen. An undisciplined soul is easy prey. In other words, you're, you're, you're easy pickings. You are easy pickings. The enemy's not going to go after somebody he knows that is strong in the Lord. He's going to go out and see, the Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It ain't talking about your flesh. Your flesh has no ability. Your flesh has no ability whatsoever. All it is is a vehicle for your soul and your spirit. That's all it is. Your soul is the conduit, your conduit for life. Until the Holy Spirit, until your regenerated spirit controls that soul. So your soul is telling you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, what to speak, what to listen to, what to be gratify, what not to gratify, how to act, and more importantly, how to react. Because we have no self-control. We're dictated by our soul. And if you think back and look back, how many relationships have you destroyed because of an undisciplined soul? How many opportunities have you lost over an undisciplined soul? I can't count how many opportunities came my way and I blew them because I had an undisciplined soul. Because I had no filter on my mouth. Amen? Amen. Had no filter on my mind. No filter on my actions because my soul was not disciplined. But yet I see people here, I see people that are so disciplined in, 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 in life that they never lose focus and they stay the course. 
because it's a choice. It's a choice. David knew that. And that's why, he, that's why he, 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 you know, he prayed. And he said, bless the Lord, O my soul. You know why he said that? He was probably in a position where he no longer felt like blessing God. Right. So he told himself, you're going to bless God. How many times your soul told you stay home? You're mad anyway. Nobody likes you. Nobody appreciates you. Nobody talks to you. Everybody ignores you. Right? You may as well find another church. They don't even know your name. If you weren't there, they wouldn't even notice you. How many times your soul told you that? And you allowed it to run rampant in your mind. Instead of telling your soul, no, you ain't dictating to me no more. You've been causing me to lose all my life. I'm going. As a matter of fact, that's exactly how the Holy Spirit taught me how to have soul transformation. See, this kind of stuff wasn't taught when I got saved. It was all about jump, shout, holler, and hoop, hoop and holler, and let the Holy Ghost have his way. And I prayed, and I said, God, I don't know how to serve you. He says, you just do everything the opposite. And you'll serve me right. And I learned that, and as I, and, and as I got older in the Lord, and I started understanding the scriptures, I said, my God, he's talking about soul transformation. But if he would have told me, just transform your soul, I wouldn't know what he was talking about. See, soul transformation is doing the everything the opposite of the way that you want to do it. That's what allows the, your regenerated spirit to control your soul. Amen? Amen. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 25. An undisciplined soul is an easy prey. I think the, probably the, 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 the greatest example of undisciplined soul is somebody that's touchy and irritable all the time. You know anybody like that? If not, you may be that. Nobody knows what to say to you, when to say it, and how to say it because you're going to go off at any moment. You didn't, you, know, uh, you didn't say it right to me. How many ways can you say good morning? You know? let's, let's read. Proverbs 25, 8. He who has no role, rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. In the biblical days, one of the first things they needed to do around a city was to build walls. Because they had caravans and caravans and caravans of gangs going in and, and, and just robbing them. So what you're saying, if they had no walls, they were, they were prey for the enemy. If you have no control, you're prey for anger, resentment, bitterness. You're, you're, you're prey for the devil to just tempt you anytime he chooses to. Pull your string anytime you want. It, it may have been pulled by somebody you knew, but it wasn't them. It was the enemy behind you, behind them, to destroy you. The enemy doesn't play fair. God gives us the ability to stand up against it and to win the battle. But, you know, soul, soul transformation is a lifetime experience. It's a lifetime job. It's never, you, nothing you're going to get on top of it. I don't have to do it no more. It, because we do not understand the role of the spirit, soul, and body, we lose the battle, listen to this, of self-control. How many have tried to use self-control? Hmm? I'm not going to eat. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to be a kinder, gentler person. Right? That was always my goal. I wanted to be a kinder, gentler person. Because I see these preachers preaching and they're smiling and they're doing, God, I want to do that. Go, that ain't you. But I want to be like that. I don't want people to tell me, you know, when I met you, you were intimidating. Because I'm not. I am a pussycat. I really am. But I want to be able to project that, but it don't happen. How many follow what I'm talking about? The Holy Spirit wants to do a work within us, but he needs our assistance. He cannot do it without our assistance. Coming to church itself is not going to do it. You trying to develop self-control is not going to do it. You know why? Self-control is not an emotion. Self-control is a result of a disciplined soul. So we're trying to discipline our, we're trying to exercise self-control, but the one that's driving the bus doesn't have it. Right. Who's driving the bus in your life? Your soul. So if you discipline that, no matter how much self-discipline you have, self-control you try to have, it ain't going to work because the one that's driving the bus has no self-control. Just saying, I'm not going to get angry, he's not going to get, not get you angry. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. 
and we're going to see what a disciplined soul looks like. You don't have to try these things. It becomes a part of your regenerated spirit that, or your transformed soul that the regenerated spirit is able to tap into. Hallelujah. Self-control is a byproduct of soul transformation. Self-control is nothing I had to develop. I worked on my soul. How many understand that? Some of y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Soul transformation. When I work on my soul and my soul gets transformed, a byproduct of that is the fruits of the Spirit. One of them being self-control. It is automatic. So I, say all the, I tell people all the time, being a Christian, becoming a fruitful Christian is not difficult at all. It's difficult when you don't develop your soul. Because your soul dictates everything. But if you transform your soul, these things will develop in your life. Let's read. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit... The work which, is, which his presence within accomplishes is love, joy, gladness, peace. How many are seeking peace and can't find in it? Again, because your soul is driving the bus. Patience or even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-reliant, have you ever tried counting to 10 say, I'm gonna, and that didn't work? Try to go to your happy place and that didn't work? Right? You, have, you cannot develop any of these things without transforming your soul. Now I'm going to show you, let's go back to the first scripture, Freddie, how Christianity has taken the responsibility of us developing or uh, transforming our soul and depending upon the Holy Spirit, depending upon God to do it. Um, one of the most sickest uh, uh, T-shirts or bumper stickers I've ever seen is, be patient, God's not finished with me yes, yet. Yes, he is. He's done with you a long time ago. When he said it's finished, that meant he was finished all the way to the end of time. Everything he said was should be done, said, everything he wanted to do should be done is already done in the spirit. He's finished. He left the rest up to us. But here's what happened because the preachers aren't reading the word and studying the word the way they're supposed to. They're just proclaiming it and spitting it out and everybody's accepting it the way that it is. The Bible says, Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the spirit. What does fruit imply? There's a season for it to grow, right? Come on, I need you to stay with me on this. It's a process of time. God is complete within himself. There is no growth process in God. So when we read this, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we're already seeing there's fruits of the Holy Spirit that I need to attain in my life. And he'll give it to me when he's ready. Be patient. God's not done with me yet. And then the Bible is anointed. God watches over his word to perform it. The um, gra grammar and the punctuations are not anointed. Amen. They took theological men with education and degrees, and decided where to put the apostrophes, where to put the capitalizations, where to put the chapter and verse designations. And sometimes if you just read it like that, you kind of miss what the Holy Spirit's message is to the church. Amen. See, I had no education got in the way, so I was able to read it raw. But some of us can't, so let me give it to you raw. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, now in the King James Version is capital S. What does capital S mean? It should be a small s. Meaning the fruit of your regenerated spirit, not the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the regenerated spirit, a spirit that is in control of the soul, is love, joy, peace, 
long-suffering, patience, goodness, self-control. It develops within you. And it's your responsibility. Right. It's not the Holy Spirit's responsibility. And when, when I learned uh, 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 Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 22, uh, one of the things they did is they, they uh, uh, had a chalkboard and they drew a tree and they drew fruit on the tree so that we could help understand. And all that did was solidify the fact that it was the Holy Spirit's job and not my job. How many understand this? See, our, our souls are not disciplined because we ascribe to the idea that God's not finished with me yet. No, he's finished with you. It's your regenerated spirit, your born-again spirit. It's the fruit of that that develops self-control. The more you develop it, we're going to get into that later in the end of the series. The more you develop it, the more it will change. Uh, let's go to verse 16. Hallelujah. Pull up verse 16, Freddie, please. But I say, walk, live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to, controlled, and guided by the Spirit. You cannot walk in the Holy Spirit. Again, that should be a small s. And what it's implying is walk in your regenerated spirit. In other words, when you could exercise love, exercise love. When you could exercise brotherly kindness, exercise brotherly kindness. And if you do that, you will be responsive and guided by the Holy Spirit. So it's all up to us. Whether I live a transformed life or I don't live a transformed life. If you transform your soul, your behavior will change automatically. Amen. Too many times we're coming to church and we're trying to change our behavior. Don't raise your hands, but how many of you have been struggling with profanity for years? So I'm not going to swear no more. And you bang your finger. First thing that comes out of your mouth. Because your soul's not been changed. You change your soul. And what is your soul? Come on, talk to me. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your soul. If you change your soul, your behavior changes. That's why there's so many Christians who still think like they did before they were saved and still have behavioral problems because their soul's not changed. That doesn't mean they're not born again. That doesn't mean they're not saved. That doesn't mean they're not going to heaven. They are. But they're having a miserable time while they're getting there. And I don't know about you. If heaven's all that great, I don't think it should be that bad to get there. Transformation of your soul does not take a week, a month, a day, or a year until the Lord comes. We're going, to be, we're going to be working on that. It's a process that takes time and something we don't like to do or don't like or don't want to be a part of or don't understand it. Commitment. Because right. anything that gets too hard, what do we do? I'm tired of this. I'm not seeing the results I want anyway. It's not worth it. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is the transformation that is taking place in your life. See, the transformation is not about your behavior as much as it is being transformed into the image of Christ. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And all of us, as with unveiled face, because we continue to hold in the word of God, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured or transformed into his very own image in every increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is that spirit, who is the spirit. You are becoming more and more godlike as you transform your soul. You know what that means? You have less anger, you have less resentment, you have less bitterness, you have less forgiveness. Why? Because I'm being transformed into the image of God. Soul transformation is one thing that the enemy fights because that's the only way the world could see the love of God through us. When you're transformed, you have no gender biasness. When you're transformed, you have no uh, sin biasness. In other words, sin is just sin. You don't, there's not acceptable sin and unacceptable sin, but you accept all. 
when you have a transformed soul. There's too many churches today who have, do not have transformed souls and they dictate the kind of people that come in those doors. We need to be able to be like Christ. And he says, come unto me all, all. And we'll let the Father separate them. We don't have to make people change. See, when I got saved, it was automatic. You changed when you got saved. Right? Amen. You take those clothes off and you put these Tobias suits on. Amen. You want to act saved? You want to get saved? Man, you got to look like the rest of us. Staunch and stale and stiff. And it worked for a season. Some people work for six months. Some people work for a year. You see, you can't stay in a place that talks about change until, unless you change. Because you're going to get tired of hearing it. And you're going to go back out. It's imperative that you learn how to apply this word to transform your soul. Because your soul is keeping you from the joy of the Lord. Your soul is keeping you unhappy. Your soul is putting you in a place where you, see, where you fault find and criticize everything. Hear what I'm saying? It's your soul. It was the soul in the Garden of Eden that made Adam say, not me, her. It was her soul that said, not me, him. And he didn't have a soul. So he says, yeah, that's me. Your soul assesses blame. Your soul criticizes fault finds, right? Your soul does not want to change. It's been in control and it handles situations and you even manipulate your anger to control your environment. Come on, somebody say amen. So your soul knows how to make your environment comfortable for you. And it does not want to surrender because it does not know what to do if it's not in control anymore. One of the hardest things in the world is to surrender control. Who am I? What am I going to become? They're going to think I'm a punk. I used to trip on people thinking I was a punk. So I'd do things that punks didn't do to show them I wasn't a punk. And I was the biggest punk of all. I was punked by the devil. I was punked by, by, because I paid the consequences. I can care less what people think of me today. It does not bother me at all. My soul has been transformed. Your soul does not want to release you so you can make a choice to stand in the freedom that God has given you. And because of that, there's a battle within each and every one of us. There's a, way, there's a war going on within us. And without an understanding of the transformation of the soul, guess what's going to win every time? Your soul. Because your soul knows your insecurities. It's your mind, right? So if somebody fronts you off, somebody says something to you, guess what your soul's going to bring up? All them insecurities that trigger you to be angry and hostile, resentful, and noncompliant. You just got punked. See, there's one thing about being punked and not knowing you're getting punked. Don't mean nothing. I didn't know I was getting punked. But now you're going to know you got punked. So how are you going to deal with it when your soul tries to punk you? Who they think they are talking to you like that. You should give them a piece of your mind. Right? It does not want to relinquish its hold over you. My soul made me do things and say things that caused great bodily harm to me. And loss of freedom. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I had to pay the price for it. Yeah. I'm thanking God. See, the scripture says, who the Son has set free is free indeed. Right. You ain't free indeed unless you have soul transformation. Yeah. Amen. You know, that, that means I can get mad if I choose to, but I choose not to. Yeah. Do you have that kind of freedom? Mm-hmm. Come on. I can swear if I want to, but I choose not to. Right. I could be respected persons if I want to, but I choose not to. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. Your soul is waging a battle within. Hallelujah. 1 Peter 2.11, let's read. Beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles in the world to abstain from sensual urges, the evil desires, the passions of the flesh, 
Your lower nature. What is your lower nature? Your undisciplined soul. So he said, passions of the flesh. The, the, my flesh has no passion. None. The desire for that third chocolate cake is my soul. And guess what happens? My soul wants to humiliate my flesh because I eat that third piece of chocolate cake. Guess what happens to my flesh? My soul don't care. Because the bigger I get, the more insecure I get, the more threatened I get, the more inferior I get, the more, the more I crawl into a shell and want to die. Your soul is out to destroy you because Satan's been controlling it your entire life and God for the first time has given you the ability to conquer your soul and we don't work on it. Everybody else is the problem. Amen. The praise team, the musicians, uh, the pastor. That's always the pastor. No, the problem is you. You got a soul that's stinking and God trying to help you get it to get, get transformed and you refuse to work on it. And worse yet, you work on it for a month and you think you should be delivered. <laughs> Man, it's taken me 66 years. Whatever. <laughs> Want me to tell your age? <laughs> Amen. Next time we go out, I'm standing up. Say, hey, her birthday, she's 72 today. <laughs> it's taken me 67 years to have an awareness of the problems of my soul. Do you think 67 years of captivity is going to be vanquished in six months? No. No. Well, people don't. Yeah, people treat you according to your soul. Hallelujah. Evil desires the passions of the flesh. Again, the flesh has no passions. To prove that, go to any mortuary. The soul is absent in the body, so the flesh can't do nothing because all it is is a vehicle to get to the refrigerator. A vehicle to get to your passion. And it's the soul that's driving everything. All right? The passions of the flesh, your lower nature, your undisciplined soul, is dictating all of your desires. Every time you, cho you choose to tell somebody off or to be disrespectful, to somebody, your soul is saying, I'm going to lash out at them and I don't care who's listening. I don't care how it changes the environment. I'm going to dig this because I want to. I'm somebody. That's right. Hallelujah. You know, I have more respect and more honor for somebody that walks humbly than I do for somebody who stands above the crowd and pushes the way through. And before, strength meant everything to me. Let's go back, Freddie. I wasn't done. The passage... Hallelujah. Evil desires, the passions of the flesh, your lower nature, that wage war against the soul. There's a war going on within us. And we go along with it because we've been going along with it our entire life. If it feels good, hallelujah, we know that. Right? After all, you know, uh, 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 doctors tell us it's not good to hold anger in. So I better let it out. Right. Yeah, right. get them endorphins going. Go do some exercise. Go do something besides venting on somebody and creating another, uh, creating another problem. Yeah. Mark chapter 1. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Yes. Let's read. And they entered into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he went into the synagogue and began to teach. And they were completely astonished at his teachings, for he was teaching as one who possessed authority and not as the scribes. Just at that time, there was in their synagogue a man who was in the power of an unclean spirit. Your unregenerated spirit, now, now you know, they could say he was a demon, but 
Your unregenerated spirit is an unclean spirit. Amen. Have you ever been sitting in a church and I'm preaching and you just don't like what I'm saying and you just want to say, shut up? <laughs> Come on, somebody say, just say amen. <laughs> or you just want to get up and walk out because you don't like what I'm saying? That's your undisciplined soul. And here's the problem with that. We have ushers. Ushers. They have no clue about transformed souls that handle it in the flesh and create a bigger problem. Listen to this. Immediately raised a, a deep, terrible cry from the depths of his throat saying, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. He was a man with an unclean spirit who got disturbed by the preaching that could not contain himself. That's just like my preaching here. and Charlie decides to stand up and vent his frustration. That's what was happening. Jesus was not telling them about the condemnation that was coming. He didn't tell them about the judgment that was coming. He was proclaiming the word. And the word agitated somebody's undisciplined soul. To the point where he quit. Wait a minute. Hold on. Did you come to torment us before our time? I'm sure everybody's looking around. What's this guy talking about? His undisciplined soul. And churches don't know how to handle undisciplined souls. I had a woman in my previous ministry. She used to come to church every Sunday. And she'd sit in the front row right here. She had a cowboy hat on. And, you know, and, and, and I, the whole time I'm preaching, she never ever showed up. I showed up. Acting up the whole time. All my ushers, everybody wanted to attack. I said, leave her alone. Amen. Pay no attention to it. She's a troubled soul. Right. Listen to me. When somebody comes at you sideways, anybody ever came at you sideways? Yes. And you handled back accordingly? Yes. We have two undisciplined souls arguing with one another. That's all it is. I have people come at me sideways all the time. But I realize it's not them. It's their undisciplined soul that's coming that way. So I'm going to control the situation and bring peace to their soul and win them. Here's an example of that. Lord, you shouldn't go to the cross. Get behind me, Satan. Your undisciplined soul is guiding you and Satan's using you. Because you don't care about the things of God. This undisciplined soul started acting up in the service. And I let the woman alone and let her alone, let her alone. And because she was not handled or manhandled in the way that the ushers wanted to handle her. She had an opportunity to hear the life changing word month after month after month. And one day she came to church. There was a beautiful woman dressed up in a dress, smiling, worshiping the Lord, sitting in the same spot. Amen. It was her. Amen. It was her. I'm saying that this here. Come here. These two individuals are worshiping together. Mm -hmm. They have a problem. <laughs> Turn this way. <laughs> they have a problem. How many know when you work with people, you're going to have a problem? Yep. How many know if you put two people together, no matter who they are, yep. you're going to have a problem? I used to have this bright idea. If I just get a married couple, put them together, <laughs> she already tells me what to do at home. <laughs> Come on, Pastor, give me a break. <laughs> so here he is running his mouth. <laughs> what do you think she's going to do? <laughs> Amen. Knowing Karen, she does. She does. But for the most part, all of a sudden, they're both running their mouth. Right? True. right? True. Now, they just projected how Christians behave. Two undisciplined souls acting out. Mm -hmm. right. One of them needs to discipline their soul and be humble. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Undisciplined souls are in the churches today. But because we have pride issues... I ain't going to allow your undisciplined soul to outdo my undisciplined soul. Amen. You think you could talk smack? You ain't got nothing on the king. Listen, 
This has been a problem since the beginning of time. You think this blow your mind? I get preach you a story about the strong man. I was talking to one pastor one time. He said, oh, brother, you're going to hell for that. I go, okay, well, God bless you. <laughs> Turn to Romans, Romans chapter 7. Paul had a problem with his soul. Paul did not walk on water. John did not walk on water. Jesus was the only one that walked on water. And if we objectively look at the word of God and see these men as normal as they are, you would find yourself being okay too. There's, you're a work in process, progress. Enjoy the journey instead of beating yourself up on what you're not. Amen. You see, I'm not attained yet. There's a whole bunch of stuff in my life that ain't right. I want to make it right. But I look at how far I've come, and I know I've not been sitting here too long, so I know that I'm still going in the right way. So I lighten up on myself. So you need to lighten up on yourself. The Apostle Paul had the same problem. Let's read Romans 7, 15. For I do not understand my own actions. Hallelujah. I don't think you need to be awake more than 10 minutes to quote that. <laughs> Amen. God bless me today. Amen. Let this be a good day. And then everybody wakes up. I'm baffled and I'm bewildered. Those are, that is not the condition of a Christian. I do not practice or accomplish what I wish. Father, I'm praying. Let me be a patient person today. Let me exercise kindness and goodness. Let me love everybody. Give me an opportunity to express your kindness, Father. Excuse me, I only got this milk. You think I can cut in front of you? No. I've been standing in line for a long time. Amen. We had a kid in Sunday school one time, man, and uh, I forget what it was, but they came out with big bags of candy. I said, dude, what do you guys do? I got candy. He said, we get to Sunday school? And I go, oh, that's good. He goes, what did you guys learn? He goes, we learned about sharing. I go, really? I said, and you like, did you learn? He goes, yeah. I said, can I have a piece of candy? He goes, nope. <laughs> he did it in a practice. <laughs> How many of you are all guilty of that? Yeah. Amen. I do not practice or accomplish what I wish, but I do the very thing which I loathe, which my moral instinct condemns. The Apostle Paul had the same problem. His soul was not, but if you read a little bit later, you'll see that he brought it under submission and subjection of the Holy Spirit, and his soul got transformed. Matter of fact, he penned not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if the Apostle Paul had that problem, what makes you think you're going to be exempt? What makes us different is we don't work on it. We got this thing in our mind. If I just go to church, I'll be okay. Right? I don't need to study for myself. I don't need to read for myself. I don't need to pray for myself. I just need to get involved and do works. Right. Works are going to send you to hell. Amen. Let's go to James chapter 1. Starting at verse 1. Hallelujah. Your soul. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes, scattered among abroad among Gentiles in the dispersion, greetings, rejoice. Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, whenever you are enveloped in an encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations. Be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith bring out endurance, steadfastness, and patience. For let, steadfa let it endurance, steadfastness, and patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may perfectly and fully develop with no defects lacking in nothing. I believe the King James says it's good for your soul. See, trials and tribulations are good for your soul because they, think they teach you patience. But we want everything when? How? How? Your soul is never satisfied. Your soul wants more. How many times you ate a meal and you were full, but it looked good. It was still there. My son and I went into Best Buy a couple weeks ago. And he said it and I followed suit. Right? Because I don't like coming here because I want to buy a bigger TV and I don't need one. 
Hallelujah. Yeah, I want to buy everything. <laughs> My soul was not happy. I got a big TV at home, but I seen a bigger TV at Best Buy. How many understand that? He's telling me about these new wireless speakers. Now I have wireless speakers. He said, oh, but these are better. And I said, I don't want to see them. Because, you know, my soul was crying for them. Right? I got plastic. You know, your soul will get you in trouble with your plastic. Amen. It ain't real money anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but I want it. I used to have a hard time. I still have a hard time, but I used to have a harder time telling my soul no. Show me a piece of chrome and I'm drooling on it, man. I don't care if it's a car, motorcycle, it's chrome, I gotta have it. But nobody sees it, I gotta have it. That's my soul. I've not learned how to control that part of it yet. The suit, I don't need that. The pants, I don't need that. Oh, but that chrome. Your soul knows exactly what it takes to get you to be undisciplined. See, and God, you know, God doesn't want your soul disciplined only in one area. But self-control in every single area of our life. And the problem with that is we are bombarded. Our soul is bombarded every day with newer, bigger, better. Right? You don't need a 72-inch TV when you have a 10 by 10 kitchen, front room. <laughs> TV is half the size of your front room. <laughs> oh, but I want it. Because we're bombarded. All of society is appealing to your soul. Come on. And if you're not mindful of that, you will sell out to that. Amen. First John chapter 2. Let's read uh, verse 15. Do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. He's talking about the world system. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the craving for sensual, again, flesh has no feelings, it has no lust. It's your soul. For craving for sensual gratifications and the lust of the eyes, greedy longings, while well, the soul is fed through our eyes, of the mind and the pride of life, assurance of one's own resources and the stability of earthly things, these do not come from the Father, but from the world itself. So, you know, you ever buy a brand new car, a brand new vehicle, or a brand new something, and you like it until you see something, somebody with something better? Yeah. That's your soul. That's why the Bible says be satisfied with, or be content with where we're at and what we have. Contentment, contentment is an indication of a disciplined soul. Amen. And it's something that we don't have. Right? An undiscipl an undisciplined soul is disqualified. There's many of us in the body of Christ that has disqualified us from doing the works that God's called us to do because we won't discipline ourselves. You know, you want to proclaim the word. You want to do this, you want to do that, you want to do the other thing. But you won't submit yourself to the Spirit of God every day. You won't study on a regular basis. You do it until the door will open for you. If the door don't open, then you quit. The Apostle Paul understood the value of self-discipline, but understood the self-discipline was only uh, accessible by a transformed soul. Again, I want to say this. You can only have self-control when you have a transformed soul. You have a transformed soul when you know that your thought process is 100% opposite of what it used to be. See, I used to think that if you got burnt, it was your fault. You deserved it. I used to think if you go to work and I don't need, I don't need to work as hard as everybody else. No, I need to work harder. See, God had to do some real changes in my life. And the hardest change, that I, saving me by his grace was probably the easiest thing. Transforming my soul was the most difficult. Because I'd be good for a day, a week, a month, and then some fool would honk his horn at me. Show me that I wasn't there yet. Or somebody would cuss me out. Or somebody would make me feel embarrassed. Ooh, don't, 
Don't ever embarrass an undisciplined soul. They will come against you. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Hallelujah. An undisciplined soul is a disqualified soul. Or they ought to be. I see a lot of people in leadership that have no business in leadership. They have little people skills. They don't bring peace. They're great dictators. They love telling people what to do. But it ain't about telling, it's about showing. It's about getting in there and working with them. You know, when uh, we were doing all the construction around this property, and, you know, um, I could have the pe people that were with me, they, they respected me enough that all I had to do was sit down and watch. But that wasn't enough for me. I worked side by side with them. Just as hard as they did. Tried to outwork some of them. Why is that? Because my soul has been transformed. Especially about leadership. Leadership is about servant leadership. You lead by serving. You don't lead by telling. But our soul doesn't understand that because we think being a leader is I'm the boss and you're not. I tell you what to do. No, dude, show me what to do. You show me what to do, I will follow you. But you tell me what to do, I ain't got two cents for you. Many of us are disqualified because our soul has not been transformed. And it stops us from becoming the, very, the essence of everything God wants us to be. And it's never too late. It's never too late. Let's read. Therefore, I do not run uncertainty without definite aim, I do not box like one beating the air and striking without an, ad, uh, an adversary, but like a boxer, I buffet my body. Again, his body, can, he cannot do anything to his body without his soul. Then I'm taking control over my soul. And you're going to see the results of that by how the body looks. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm taking control of the life-giving force within me, which is in my soul. The proof of that is I'm not 300 pounds no more. Now I'm 150. How'd you get there? I disciplined my soul. Not my body. My body has never cried out to slap somebody. My body has never cried out to eat a second cheeseburger. When I don't know how anybody could eat two I know people that can, but I don't know how, right? It's always my soul. Handle it roughly, discipline it in hardships, by hardships, and subdue it. That's a battle. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, let's turn there before we go any further, uh, uh, for, for I'm not able to finish this. Galatians chapter 5, 16, 17. Let's read. Let's say walk in the spirit. That's not the scripture I was thinking of. Oh, hallelujah. That's not the scripture I was thinking of. Um, the Bible says that the, 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 the uh, flesh and the spirit, they war against one another. The Holy Spirit does not want anything to do with your flesh. Let, yeah, pull that up, Ephesians 2. In which time, at one time you walked habitually, you were following the course and the fashion of this world. Were under the sway and the tendency of this present age, following the prince and the power of the air, you were obedient to and under the control of the demon spirit that still constantly works in the sons of disobedience, the careless ones. The rebellious and the unbelieving who go against the purposes of God. Among those who were as you once lived and conducted yourself according to the passions of our flesh, our behavior, governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, our cravings dictated by our senses and our dark imaginations, we were then by nature 
children of God's wrath and heirs of his indignation like the rest of mankind. We were by nature controlled by our five senses which the soul dictates. The flesh of the spirit, they war against one another. The Holy Spirit wants nothing to do with your flesh. The Holy Spirit is not lusting for your flesh. Your soul is lusting to have dominance over your flesh. So there's a battle within us. What are you going to let win? When you get discouraged and you feel like getting depressed, most of y'all will find a chair, a couch, a dark spot, and you'll run with it. Nobody likes me. Nobody calls me. I'm disrespected. I'm unappreciated. And you run with it and your souls tell you, that's right. Nobody but me. Let's go down this dark path again. Right? You're going to repent later, but let's do it again because it feels good. Right? Instead of standing, you know, it, it's something. We need to learn how to talk to ourselves. That's right. Right. I am the best conversationalist I know to me. Yeah. Amen. I talk to myself all the time. I used to tell myself stuff, stuff like, now that was stupid. <laughs> I used to repeat stuff that people said about me. You're an idiot. I don't do that no more. Now I'm like David. If I feel depression or oppression coming on and I have no reason to feel that way because things are good for me, I tell myself, why art thou downcast, O my soul? I'm questioning why he's taking me there. You need to start questioning why your soul's taking you somewhere. Why is your soul taking you to a depressed place? Because he's fearful he's losing his grip on you. David said, why art thou downcast, O my soul? I'm blessed, I'm highly favored, God's in my life, joy's in my home, peace is in my life. Why am I downcast? Oh, I got no reason to, other I'm listening to the lies of my soul. Yes. There's a war going on in your head. And you're guaranteed to be the victor if you just stand up and take authority. Did you learn something this morning? Come on, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's a battle going on.